for hello everyone. Uh, so for English speakers, uh, please there is from the down menu you have the world sign where you can choose your preferred language. So if you choose to hear everything in English, then please choose English. Um, if you want to hear it in Arabic, then please choose Portuguese. And um, if you don't want to hear the translator at all and you're fine with both languages, then please choose off. مرحبا جميعا. أكو عندنا بالشريط الجوة أكو علامة العالم. على مود واحد يقدر بيختار من عدة الترجمة. إذا حاب تسمع بالإنجليزي، بليز اختار إنجليزي. إذا حاب تسمع العربي، بليز اختار بورتغيز. لأنه مشان أكو عندنا لغة عربية، اختار أي دولة. وإذا أنت ما عندك مشكلة تسمع اللغتين، فبليز حط على أوف. أكيد يعني البرتغيز يعني البرتغالي. بورتغيز يعني بورتغيز يعني برتغال طبعاً أكيد. وخلص أنا هاي عندي. أكو الأتنديز موجودين رند رند أوكي شو دا يستاهل دا يستاهل يا أوكي هلا أبريوان رح أتحدث بال بال باللغة العربية Usually, when I'm hosted by the Strategic Center by Anthony in USA, he always say a sentence. He keeps he keeps repeating it since we are talking about the Middle East and about Iraq. So we can always expect some delay, like ten minutes or fifteen minutes. So I tried my best not to have any delay this time and to be sharp on time. Today's topic is very important, so I would like to thank you a lot for being with us. Thank you for joining us. This is the first time of having such experiments. Hopefully it's going to be successful. And I would like to sincerely thank my colleagues, my friends, the participants in this webinar. They are strategists, um, important thinkers. This webinar um, comes after the invitation of the um, State Department uh, Minister, uh, Mr. Antio, to start a strategic dialogue between USA and Iraq that is supposed to start in next June. And such dialogue is at the background of a number of factors, most important of which is the existence of, un, of political instability in Iraq. In Iraq, since October uh, 2019 until now, is going through a state of instability because of the demonstrations and the stints that happened. And this dialogue is going also to start in an electoral year in USA. And we know that the USA electoral year would witness um, a lot of media uh, in Washington, DC. Uh, yes, it's true that uh, the external policy is not of the priority of the uh, um, American voter, but yet it's important. This uh, dialogue comes uh, within the um, acceleration of uh, the disputes uh, and disagreements between USA and Iran, whether this agreement or this conflict is direct or through the, uh, some uh, disputes, uh, some clashes with uh, uh, popular uh, hashed uh, or um, other parties in Iraq and uh, the pressure over uh, the USA to withdraw from Iraq, especially after the decision of the Iraqi parliament to uh, make the forces leave Iraq. Also, during the previous few years, I noticed 
a very important and severe dialogue between two intellectual schools in USA. The first one that says Iraq is or became a, a failure state and we need to withdraw from it and uh, uh, staying there it means only uh, having more resources over there and there's no uh, use of it this is school is, exists and maybe people in 2019 uh, 2018 people from the department of the state and uh, the defense some of them and i also i also read an article in foreign affairs about this uh, topic and there's another school that says no iraq is strategically important for usa and it is for uh, or it's at the side of the interest of the USA and we need to enhance our relationships with Iraq within such atmosphere we have this seminar to know more what uh, does the American uh, politics want what's its aspiration and its vision about the situation between Iraq and USA so we can help decision makers in Iraq to understand what Americans need or want and hence it's going to be a point to start a fruitful dialogue how this dialogue is going to end we don't know maybe our panelists today will tell us a little about this but we want to do our homework before starting the dialogue and we in II uh, yes. we want also to help in this respect and there's a question that was repeated more than once for me what is the need for the strategic dialogue between USA and Iraq within the existence of what's called the strategic uh, the strategic framework agreement that is still active of course, so far has ended, uh, but the strategic framework agreement is still active and effective. So why do we need strategic dialogue? And we already have such agreement. Such questions and others we, uh, would be discussed with our um, esteemed panelists. And I will start with a bio about each one of them first i would like to start with dr david pollock david pollock he's a phd holder in and he's also um, in washington center of for studies uh, in the middle east and um, he's a senior uh, researcher. Uh, he previously worked in uh, um, the uh, Department of State for 25 years, and including five of them as a senior uh, uh, expert uh, for the policies in the uh, Middle East, and also worked in Iraq for two tours. And since 2006, he's a uh, a prominent visitor for Iraq. I will start with Mr. Uh, David Pollock and I want to ask him a question directly and say hello David. David speaks Arabic so that's why I'm going to talk with uh, to him in Arabic. Previous, a few, oh, sorry, uh, during the few previous years, just like I mentioned, there was um, a, a dispute about the strategic importance of Iraq for USA. I remember in 2018 when you hosted me in Washington Institute and you said, or you gave three reasons that make Iraq important for the USA. So we want to start with this issue. 
what is the importance of Iraq for USA? Thank you, uh, Mon Dr. Munkaz, and thank you, dear guests. I think there are different uh, reasons for the importance of Iraq for USA, but uh, frankly and honestly, I would start saying Iraq is not within the priorities of the uh, foreign uh, policies of USA. I say this unfortunately, but I think this is the reality. And despite this, we can say that Iraq comes second in the priorities or the attention of USA in, uh, in the foreign policies, in, especially in Middle East. Why? Because the stability in the region is very important for USA in general. So strategically speaking, economically, uh, diplomatically, even personally. And without the uh, stability inside Iraq and without good relationships, or at least reasonable relationships between Iraq and uh, neighboring countries, there's no possibility for stability in the region in general. But this is the first point. The second point, and maybe this is very critical. Actually, as we all know, Iraq, according to the American official uh, evaluation and my personal evaluation, Iraq is, is considered or is uh, um, possibly considered the block uh, in front of the uh, Iranian domination in the region. And this is for the interest of Iraq. They need to to confront uh, these aspirations of Iran. And it's also for the interest of the American policy in the region and in the world. And uh, the third reason, I think, there are possibilities for Iraq in the economy or the, in the economic field, uh, despite the decrease of uh, fuel uh, prices and despite uh, the less attention of the world um, for such uh, issue due to coronavirus and uh, the uh, pandemic, uh, Iraq, of course, have huge resources in pertaining oil, pertaining agriculture, uh, trade, uh, possible trade in the region and outside the region. So that's why I think for the global economy and the regional economy and the health of the uh, American economy inside the region and outside the region, Iraq is important uh, on the um, long term. And this is a reason for this. Maybe this is not tangible, but it, it, it's important. And this reason is related uh, to the uh, American credibility and the American reputation as an as a, an um, uh, accounted ally and as a responsible uh, state uh, committed to the agreements and different uh, different agreements uh, with uh, all the countries in the region. So that's why. Whoever says that Iraq is not important for uh, USA, this is wrong. And uh, the proof of that, the two pres previous presidents, or let's say Obama, the previous one, and uh, Trump, the, the present one, each of them uh, decided uh, the withdrawal of Iraq and changed their mind. Was this uh, did this decision uh, happen really? Obama withdrew um, from or withdrew uh, its army from Iraq after 2011, and, and it was also in Syria and in America. But it went back to some extent, and Trump also said that he wants to withdraw 
from uh, Iraq, from the region in general. But again, he decided that uh, USA need to stay in Iraq and also in Syria, military-wise and also economically, politically. And I think this is an evidence that the biggest possibility whether he's the winner in the elections, next elections, uh, whether he's Trump or Joe Biden, I think we may see the existence or the remaining of the um, uh, geo uh, geopolitical um, existence of America in the region. I think this is the most important point in this dialogue. I think this American existence is for the interest of both countries, of both states, America and Iraq. Um, one side, the Iraqi sovereignty, the Iraqi unity, the Iraqi interests, so that no any other country would uh, have control of, over their uh, destiny. Dr. David, we still have five minutes, more five minutes for you. Uh, I want to see your vision for this strategic, for this strategic dialogue. What is your vision about it? How is it going to be? What if it fails? What if it succeeds? If it fails, I think, if it doesn't succeed, I think it's going to be a disaster for Iraq, a tragedy for Iraq, and a loss for uh, USA, because it's worth mentioning, of course, that was in the past, but we all need not to forget that without the American help or assistance for Iraq, Iraq would be under the control of Saddam Hussein or ISIS or Iran. Unfortunately, this is true. But uh, this is, these are facts in the end. So that's why if from Iraq's end, um, this dialogue need to succeed and maybe unofficial success or undeclared success, but a, a, a success in the field, meaning that in the end, at the end of this strategic dialogue in uh, June, just like uh, Michael Burke uh, mentioned or declared, I expect that it's for the interest of Iraq and for the interest of USA, there would be some understanding. It could be official or not without uh, uh, agreements, without voting at the parliament for the existence of a limited um, uh, or uh, to vote for the limited existence of the American army and also uh, to stay as a symbol or as a kind of a guarantee for the continuance of the uh, American attention um, of Iraq and also for uh, giving the assistance for Iraq in the future. And uh, uh, actually, we think it's a good uh, chance, uh, according to my own personal evaluation, it's a good uh, chance to enhance and to encourage the good uh, mutual relationships between uh, USA and Iraq, despite the uh, health crisis and the security crisis, the economic crisis. I would say, due to these crises, um, there's a good opportunity because both countries need to be encouraged and need to enhance such relationships for the mutual mutual uh, interests. Thank you, David. I will go now to Michael. Michael, can you hear me, please? I can hear. Okay, Michael. Recently, you published an article discussing the effects of uh, uh, Zurfi and Al Qadumi as prime minister, as a prime minister on uh, U.S. strategy and uh, the interests of 
uh, United States and, and Iraq. Uh, of course, uh, I'll tell you that your article has been circulated widely, uh, published widely, translated also, and uh, I think there are a lot of interest from uh, audience to hear more about your point of view on the importance of the prime minister, the Iraqi prime minister on the uh, uh, dialogue between Iraq and United States. Thanks very much. Uh, it's an honor to be here. And I hope we do more of these kind of events because um, it's a way of bringing Washington and Baghdad closer. Ne next and so time we understand each other. Next time it will be your call, Winnip call. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, I understand. So um, the Iraqi Prime Minister is very, very important. In Washington, we have had some bad experiences with trying to be involved in selecting an Iraqi prime minister. And this time, the Washington administration was really stepping back and saying, it's up to you know Iraqis, and we, we don't really care who is the prime minister. And one of the things I say to the US leaders here in State Department, White House, is no. It's vital who is the Iraqi prime minister, the character of that man or woman, uh, the, and what they do is the most important thing in Iraqi politics. Nothing else is as important as the identity and the actions of the Iraqi prime minister. It's not just a symbol. It also affects everything. In Iraq, Iraq can be a great country, Iraq can have great military forces, its economy could be strong, as long as it has strong leadership at the top. If the leadership is bad, everything is bad. From a military unit, to a province governor's office, to the prime minister's office. Leadership is everything. So I think the US government became more focused on the identity of the prime minister about halfway through this process quite late in the process. But one thing I want to say is this, the US government just wants a good person in the prime minister's office. We were happy to support Mohammed Tafiq Alawi. We were happy to support Naim al Suhail. They're both good men. We're happy to support Adnan al Zerfi. Little surprised that he <laughs> emerged, but uh, happy. Happy to support Mustafa Academy. Uh, any of them would be fine. The identity of the Iraqi Prime Minister is important. Uh, relations with Washington can either improve slowly or quickly, depending on the characteristic of the Prime Minister. Uh, Mustafa Academy is known to us, he's trusted by us. Uh, we're open to him. We can work with him very quickly. This, these are the important things about his character. The same would have been true for Zerfi. I think the same would have been true for Naim al Suhail very quickly, and even with Mohammed Taufik Alawi. Uh, but it's important to note David Schenker, uh, with us at the Washington Institute for decades now the uh, Assistant Secretary for Near East Affairs, the most senior US State Department official on, Iraq, on uh, the Middle East. When asked, uh, what does it mean if Mustafa Academy becomes Prime Minister? He said, it would be great for our bilateral relations. He had no wow. hesitation. Because we know him, because we trust him, because we understand Michael, his thinking uh, maybe. Michael, sorry for interruption, but since we have Iraqi audience, they might enter uh, or uh, uh, translate this into a different way. Being good with Americans, or you know them, uh, you know him well, they might think that he is working for, for the United States. So this is a very sensitive issue, and I want you to, to put some more highlights on that, please. Sure, sure. 
Well, first of all, as the head of intelligence for the last couple of years, he is the one who manages the intelligence relationship with the United States. The reality is you have to put somebody in as head of Iraqi National Intelligence Service, who ultimately who the Iranians will accept and who the Americans will trust their secrets with. So for a number of years now, he's been balancing the two, which is a good skill to have if you're an Iraqi prime minister. You have to be acceptable to the Iranians or you don't get the job. That's how it was. You have to be able to work with the Americans and be trusted by them. So as intelligence, as basically head of the Iraqi National Intelligence Service, you have to do both those things. You also have to be able to go to Riyadh and to Ankara and you know to Cairo. So you're always a balancer if, if you're in that job. Uh, you know, the, when it comes down to it, uh, he's been a character who's been on the scene for a long time as an intellectual, as a writer, as a journalist, as a civil society person, as a person um, uh, who is uh, writing the history of the Ba'athist crimes against the Iraqi people. Uh, so everyone has got a chance to get to know him over a long period of time. The Iraqi people, not so much, uh, but, you know, certainly in international circles, he's very well known. And the Brits know him, the French know him, uh, the Germans, uh, the Japanese. Everybody knows the time. Um, but, you know, there's a second part of an Iraqi prime minister. There's his character, but there's also his actions. And ultimately, Mustafa Kadami, like any other prime minister, will be judged by his actions, uh, by the United States in particular. Can he protect his guests, his international agencies, the, uh, the Americans, the Brits, uh, you know, others, the diplomats, the military advisors, can he protect them? In America, our particular concern is, can he protect the use of our dollar? Can he push for energy independence in Iraq? Because there's no real reason why Iraq should be dependent on any external power for gas or for electricity. It makes no sense. And we're willing to help that energy independence go forward. If Iraq says, no, thank you. Well, that's a very confusing signal for us. Why would you not want to save money? Why would you not want to use your own gas to create electricity? Why do you want to buy electricity from Iran and gas from Iran? It doesn't make sense, especially if we're willing to help you. So we'll be watching very closely for that. And we'll be watching very closely on security cooperation. The Islamic State is very slowly starting to recover. You can see it in Salahuddin, in Northern Diyala, particularly, in the Baghdad belts, Tamiya, West Baghdad, Abu Ghraib. You can see it in a number of places. The US and Iraq have to work together in the future. One of the reasons the Islamic State has expanded in the last six months is because the US-led coalition has been kept in its bases They've been threatened by militias. They have lost some of their overhead surveillance capabilities. And you can see the enemy, Daesh, reacting to that. Above everything, we want Iraq to, an Iraqi prime minister, to protect Iraq's sovereignty against everyone, even us. <laughs> you know, <laughs> because right now, the US would be very happy for, to see a prime minister who put Iraq first. Why? Because ultimately, we are thousands of miles away. We're not in Iraq to take over Iraq. But from our perspective, Iran is in Iraq to take over Iraq. And it's right next door. And it's already very powerful. So an Iraq first prime minister who pushes Iraq's interests, it, it makes us more reassured. It will not make the Iranians reassured. They're scared by that person. That's why they try to stop it. But just to finish off, um, on a positive note, David Schenker, the Assistant Secretary for Near East Affairs, when he's asked about the US-Iraq strategic dialogue, he says, he starts by saying, the US is a friend Iraq can trust in good times and bad. He then says, we are the ones who provide quietly, this is the US way to quietly provide aid for COVID instead of Chinese bring a big plane in, <laughs> 
nothing works <laughs> that they provide, uh, but everyone sees it. The US comes at night and quietly provides lots of assistance that does work. But he says, we are a brand you can trust. Our aid on COVID is not a public relations stunt. If, you, if that translates okay. He says, you know, we for years have been tra training health, uh, health uh, fellows, you know, academics uh, in the health sector across various ministries and institutions. He says the US is the largest donor for demining activities to remove landmines and unexploded ordnance. He says the US is the largest security aid provider to fight Daesh. And then at the end, he says, the US looks forward, the US is a true friend of Iraq. This is a very hopeful message coming after many months of anger between the US and Iraq back and forth. He's trying to set the tone for the US strategic dialogue saying we are very hopeful. I asked David uh, the other day, you know, what, what are the things that could um, go right in the future in the region? And I was very surprised. The first thing he said was Iraq. And that's not something you hear in US government over the last couple of years. But he said if Iraq could get a good prime minister who could move the country in the right direction, uh, this could be one of the biggest changes possible across the entire Middle East. And so I'll leave you with that hopeful message. U.S. government wants the U.S.-Iraq dialogue to work. And it wants to be seen as a good friend of Iraq. And it believes that positive change is possible. Thank you, Michael. And uh, just uh, one comment. Uh, last night I was listening to... Uh, an interview with uh, our health uh, minister who mentioned that uh, United States till now donated 14 million dollars and he has a good right now uh, as he say that we have a good uh, talk and negoti negotiation with United States to uh, rise this to be 140 million dollars which make it the first donor for COVID uh, in, in, in Iraq. This is a, a quite strong uh, message, I believe. Uh, uh, shukran, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Knight, and I'm Fatni. Fatni and Araf with Dr. Michael Knight. I missed uh, to introduce Dr. Michael Knight to give uh, a small uh, introduction about him. So I'm sorry, Michael. Michael uh, holds a PhD degree from King's College in Britain, and he's a senior researcher in Washington Institute for the Middle East Studies, specialized in security studies. And he has a long history studying the region, and specifically in Iraq. And he delivers um, consultations for the US government every now and then about uh, Iraq. Thank you, Michael. Now it's time for my friend and my colleague, Dr. Bilal, Bilal Wahab, from Washington Institute for Middle East Studies, uh, e, uh, um, Near East Studies, so, uh, sorry. Uh, Mr. Bilal, he's from Sulaymaniyah. Uh, he's a graduate of Saladin University, bachelor de degree, and then he uh, pursued his uh, master degree and PhD degree from ISA. University and he's also a researcher for Washington in Washington Institute and since he's a Kurdish and uh, uh, he speaks fluent Arabic Arabic sorry so I'm going to ask Mr. Bilal to talk about the effect of this internal policy Iraqi policy on the American Iraqi relationships from an American perspective, not from an Iraqi perspective. How do you see Americans 
look at the relationships and its effects on this dialogue, on this strategic uh, dialogue between uh, America and Iraq. Yes, please, Bilal. Thank you, Dr. Munkad. Uh, good morning, good evening uh, in uh, both parts of the world, and thank you for hosting me. The basic question actually is the dialogue uh, necessary and how is this going to be in the interest of, for both countries, for both the states and the strategic relationship between them? Uh, meaning um, to have a fruitful uh, dialogue and uh, to be between two strong uh, countries. And this is the basis. Uh, so the main blame of America over Iraq is that uh, there's no state, there's no representative of a state in Iraq. So there's a political chaos in Iraq that each party is uh, talking on behalf of the state and talking about the interests of the state. And there are armed militias that have members in the parliament and there are other armed uh, militias that don't have representatives in the parliament. And everybody thinks that they have the right to, um, uh, to veto against uh, uh, the prime minister or uh, um, nominated the prime minister. So states, as we know, they have their uh, mechanisms, their um, policies to make decisions, to make strategies. Then the representatives of uh, such states, they submit these interests and uh, negotiate them in the uh, international platforms. So the weakness of the state is the basic thing between about the interrelationship between America and Iraq. And as we know, the reason, um, main reason is the internal disagreements. Maybe another reason, core reason, pertaining to the um, USA-Iraqi uh, strategic uh, dialogue is can two states that are, uh, that are going through um, a transmissional uh, stage to have a strategic dialogue. Uh, USA is, go uh, is going to have elections. Trump uh, could be elected for another round. And uh, this uh, could be done in next November. This is on one side. On the other side, in Iraq, even if Mr. Kadhimi succeeded in establishing a new cabinet, it's going to be a transmissional uh, stage or state. Uh, even if it's not transmissional, he's going to continue with the two uh, years uh, for the resigned uh, Abdel Mahdi uh, prime minister. So this is the background of two states uh, that are going through uh, transmissional stages. Uh, but what you mentioned, Dr. Munkad, at the beginning of the uh, talk, that there are um, there is a framework for um, a strategy in Iraq, so maybe uh, it's time for the two countries to look into the, this relationship and a new one and not to build on a previous one. So I think the defect in the relationship is that the relation is started to come to the surface as if it's a unilateral or, or, or it has only one uh, objective or goal, which is a military one. In other words, the military existence is uh, occupying the mind of the USA and it's also occupying the mind of Iraq. So that's why uh, people, they don't see the benefit of this uh, relationship. So uh, American uh, uh, corporations, um, only ExxonMobil and General Electric, they didn't find Iraq as an open market for job opportunities, for um, um, for business opportunities. Google is not there, Amazon is not there. Uh, companies that work in agriculture, uh, agriculture industry, they are not in Iraq. Maybe they didn't have opportunity to be in Iraq. On the other side, the American street, they don't see Iraq as an important topic. Uh, to put pressure over uh, the decision maker in Iraq to enhance the relationship with Iraq. But um, uh, from the other side, the Iraqi street look at uh, Americans as only representing the military 
um, existence. Uh, just like my colleague, uh, my, uh, my, Michael Knights, uh, there are some assistance um, uh, pertaining building the state, the government, like USA, uh, support uh, the Iraqi dinar uh, and uh, protect it. But maybe ministers look at this, some MPs look at this, or, or consider this, but due to the weakness of uh, demonstrating this by both parties, so the Iraqi street or the Iraqi people uh, can touch upon this. Uh, visits are very little, uh, economic um, relationships are weak, uh, political relationships are weak. So the relationship as if, as if it is a pure military relationship. That's why from the American side, it's reasonable uh, 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 that we wait, just like David Pollock uh, mentioned, uh, that is Iraq really important to America? Uh, this is a simple question, because if we are, we are talking about a military existence, we are not talking about strategic relationship. And on the other hand, there are some parties in Iraq, when they look at the relationship uh, between the two parties, it's about uh, the relationship about of uh, 500, a uh, thousand uh, soldiers, so it's a it's, uh, um, unilateral relationship. Bilal, you mentioned a very important uh, point, which is relation currently is not considered other than uh, within a framework of one goal, which is the military. And uh, the uh, focus of uh, the media and uh, journalism is all about uh, this. So what do you think? Uh, this uh, Iraqi movement, how far did it affect uh, to reflect uh, this vision? And also the same thing with the American uh, political movement. How far did it affect uh, to reflect this vision? Uh, Washington vision to Baghdad, maybe just like I mentioned, there's a misunderstanding for the both parties. Uh, there's an Iraqi misunderstanding for the big change that happened in Washington. Uh, Trump administration is totally different from other uh, administrations, previous administrations. Iraqis still look at America, uh, or um, Iraqis still think that Americans consider Iraq as a as a resource. Um, that they can they can come to Iraq and uh, plunder their uh, wealth. Uh, so uh, we are trying uh, to um, uh, uh, to convince them that uh, the withdrawal could uh, harm the interests of uh, um, Americans. Uh, we uh, I was uh, discussing with Michael and other colleagues. Uh, in Pentagon, uh, we were talking about the interests of Iraq, in of America and Iraq, and what would happen if we withdraw from Iraq for 10 years, and uh, how could it affect it? But um, in Iraq, talking about Washington as if we are um, we are having a new things every day from WhatsApp groups, or from the American journalism, as if. Uh, um, uh, uh, they are going to have a coup, and America is going to kill X and Y, and so on. Uh, so there's a misunderstanding between the two parties, and actually, the different points of views and uh, uh, having different uh, expectations. It's not only about the military issues; it's also about the political issues. Um, the last one who visited USA is Mr. Halbusi only, and uh, there was. Um, uh, but he didn't visit the White House, and despite uh, his uh, meet with them, uh, despite uh, the meeting between Barham Saleh and uh, Trump, uh, not the Prime Minister of Iraq, uh, nor uh, the uh, uh, Prime Minister of, um, um, or any official hand uh, some uh, visit to the White House. So there is a, a feeling of uh, the um, injustice of America. Uh, maybe they look at America that they liberated Iraq from Saddam Hussein, and uh, they asked us um, to withdraw, and we withdrew, and uh, they asked us uh, to come back, and we came back. But they cannot protect the uh, diplomatics, and uh, they cannot tell us who um, threw the missiles of Katyusha. Uh, so this uh, feeling of injustice 
and the interests. And Iraqis think that this relationship is not going to be of a use, of a benefit for the Iraqi streets. Uh, even culture-wise, number, number of Iraqi students in USA are very few. Not to mention that, uh, that there are some American universities in Iraq, in Kurdistan in specific, and there is a talk about uh, American University in Baghdad. We didn't see tens of universities that are being established in Iraq, just like in the Gulf region. And despite the existence, if I go back to the diplomatic uh, issue, maybe Iraq is lucky to have an ambassador that is very um, keen, um, Mr. Farid Yassin, that represents Iraq in an excellent way. Just like I said, uh, Iraq is lucky to have Mr. Faiz, but the ambassador is uh, representing the state, and if the state is weak and uh, doesn't have a clear policy, this doesn't mean that the ambassador can do things uh, on his own. Let me say something else about the American goals in Iraq. It's clear, first thing, defeat ISIS, um, defeat, um, uh, fight Iran, and also the economic opportunity, just like you mentioned. The internal issues in Iraq, the non-existence or the, the uh, weakness of, uh, uh, or weakening uh, the uh, Iraqi government, and uh, the defeat, uh, the, the uh, sorry, the weakness due to the existence of uh, militias. Uh, maybe we keep mentioning the role of the militias, and we don't mention the role of Iranians. It started changing the, the view of uh, USA to Iraq. Another point that I want to add, Washington started feeling concerned about its allies uh, inside Iraq for a clear reasons. America or USA uh, called uh, uh, Soleimani and uh, Abu Mahdi al-Muhandis, but who benefited uh, from uh, decreasing the Iranian role in Iraq? We found that it wasn't the state, it wasn't uh, it, it wasn't the state that benefited uh, mostly from this, uh, but there was a disagreement uh, between the uh, um, Shia militias and Hashd al-Shabi, and that there was Muqtada uh, al-Sadr uh, as uh, a significant leader in Iraq, and not the real and basic uh, characters in Iraq. Uh, the relationship between the region and the center, maybe it, uh, its honeymoon was in the first year at the time or the era of Adil Abdel Mahdi. But even the role, uh, uh, the Kurdish role as an ally for America started to, uh, to weaken uh, from the Kurdish side. They are not forgiving uh, uh, USA for not helping them in their referendum. But there were some talks and uh, news uh, that uh, these uh, uh, disagreements are being uh, uh, deepened and uh, they are moving their uh, uh, um, control and authority for the other generation and there's also some um, uh, some uh, uh, closing from the Kurdish to Iran it's uh, true that um, uh, they didn't participate in the parliament uh, referendum to def to uh, uh, to sell uh, the existence of America from Iraq, but uh, they had the chance to vote for this decision. And uh, uh, they, uh, so let's say that the final results, USA changed their view uh, to Iraq. And instead of wishing to have Kurdish allies or uh, Shia allies, um, this vision, uh, such vision, uh, USA cannot uh, compete with I Iran in this respect. Uh, so uh, the main issue here is to have a strong Iraqi state because uh, the uh, USA uh, relations uh, with any state, um, this state needs to be successful and it needs to be strong enough to protect uh, their interests. And uh, if this state is going to, pre to protect uh, the Iranian interests before the Iraqi interests, so maybe this time uh, USA is going to withdraw uh, once and for all. 
thank you, Dr. Bilal, for this uh, profound uh, speak. I will move now to Mr. Anthony Kurtzman. Mr. Anthony Kurtzman is uh, a chair, a uh, work chair, also work uh, chair for the strategic, uh, uh, for strategy in the Center of International and Strategic Studies. And he served also in the State of uh, Department of State and also in the Department of Defense, um, in, the, in, uh, in the National um, Security uh, Council of Security. And he's an expert in Iraq and in the Niger and in the region, sorry. And he was summoned for Moda once um, in the Congress uh, to give his uh, testimony about uh, the um, uh, region. I have a relationship, a relationship with Mr. Kurtzman since uh, 2011 or 2010, and I keep, uh, I always have some discussions with him. And he has opinions, good opinions about Iraq. Thank you very much. Uh, Anthony, uh, recently uh, you have published uh, a piece uh, and the, the title was very, very interesting for, for me and for many Iraqis who read that, uh, that uh, article. So I will uh, ask you about uh, uh, this, uh, these, uh, what you name them as ghosts, the the three ghosts uh, uh, of uh, of Iraq, and uh, how this will affect the uh, strategy between United States and uh, uh, Iraq. Uh, and you, uh, based on that discussion you made in your piece. Uh, you also provided some recommendation for the policymakers in in United States. Can you please uh, put more lights on uh, that discussion and how uh, the the relation or these goals, these uh, the, the cost of uh, Iraq uh, affect the dialogue between United States and Iraq? Let me try, but uh, let me begin with a key point. All of us today are tending to look at the world we knew before the coronavirus and before the current oil crisis. When you look at the reporting from the World Bank and the IMF, you see that we already are at a situation where virtually all of the countries in the world face a major economic crisis in recovery. The estimates of those recoveries reported in the newspapers generally show you that the reporter never read the report from the IMF or the World Bank, because all of them assume in the press reports you recover in 2021. If you read the actual reports, they're talking about a crisis of two to three years. To put it in terms I think Iraqis can easily understand, we've already spent about $1.3 trillion in the United States on the economic impact of the coronavirus. It's very unlikely that we'll get out from under without spending another one to two trillion dollars. That is far more than we have spent on all of our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan since 9-11. The unemployment levels in the United States have reached the percentage levels of the Great Depression under very different conditions. It won't have that kind of economic effect. But the thing I have to caution about a strategic dialogue is the priorities that the US had before this began may not be the budget priorities or the strategic priorities 
that we have several months from now or a year from now. These are not minor changes. And even before this, in the Pentagon, I think the emphasis was on going back to dealing with threats like China and Russia. There was a shift away, and I think a significant one, from what's dominated us in a strategic dialogue, which is since 9-11, it has been to some extent counter-extremism and counter-terrorism. That already has shown a significant change in funding. If you look at the budget projections, regardless of what people say about policy, the money is moving into other areas. In this region, you've already seen significant reductions in counterterrorism capability and a shift to dealing with Iran. I think my colleagues pointed this out. But the, this is not the world that we had six months ago. Now, when I talked about this issue of ghosts in Iraq, it is not that all of the things that have already been said about Iraq's strategic importance in the dialogue aren't true. But I've been coming to Iraq since 1972. And that is a long time of watching government after government in Iraq shall we say, fall far short of Iraq's potential. And a prime minister may be important, but in general, if you look at the World Bank's governance ratings of Iraq, they are among the worst in the world. They are the worst in the world, among the worst in the world in all of the categories. When you look at ratings of corruption, you see Iraq is rated by probably the lead organization, Transparency International, as being the 18th most corrupt government in the world. When you have a strategic partner, you have to have not only political leadership, but governance capability. And frankly, I had hoped for far more after 2003 or 2011, but instead of seeing a positive trend, you see the World Bank rating it as negative, and you have great questions about whether Iraq can bring together even Shiites with Shiites, much less Sunnis and Shiites and Kurds. That is a key issue. And if you are going to have a successful strategic partnership, you have to have a successful partner. Whatever Iraq's economic potential is, whether it is the World Bank, the UN Development Program, the IMF, or the CIA, in that article you referred to, I did not quote myself. I quoted probably the four leading groups in the world in analyzing the economy. And they described before the coronavirus and the current oil crisis, a country whose economy had fallen far, far short of meeting the needs of its people, of moving towards development, of making the kind of progress that was necessary. Just as an example, the World Bank rated Iraq out of 192 or 172 countries, Iraq is the eighth worst country in the world in offering business opportunities and trade opportunities. All of these issues are critical. And I think it's easy to talk about $100 million worth of foreign aid, but quite frankly, what you are going to need probably over the next few years to be a strategic partner are massive loans out of the IMF. And for the first time, an economic development program that actually works. 
And if you'll excuse me, most of those development plans have bordered on being almost Saudi in character. They frankly just don't make that much sense. Just on the military side, we already have cut our air presence substantially. We've already cut the number of advisors substantially. You've moved troops into other bases, but you basically do not have a clear future here to provide the kind of train and assist aid that you are going to need. We have not declared this, but rather quietly, we suddenly stopped reporting on the air presence and activity in this region. I think that is a critical warning that if you want a strategic partner to provide aid and assistance, that is going to require this dialogue to find a way to offer security to the people who provide the training. If you wish to have air and other capabilities present, that partnership requires us to be able to work with the Iraqi military and not see Iran and popular militia forces as a threat. But more than that, if you are going to be a partner that serves your own interests, you have got to move toward ending the divisions that now exist between the military even between the Kurdish forces and central government forces, and you have to find a way to bring these popular militias under control. The other problem that I think is critical here is you were spending something like 10% of your economy on security. For a country that is effectively bankrupt, that is a totally unsustainable posture. But if you are to rebuild your own forces, not for us, but for yourself, in that article I showed you a comparison of Iraq and Iran. About 70% of your army inventory is, to be honest, when you look at the armored vehicles, questionable in terms of operational capability and sustainability you basically only have the edge of an air force. All of the fighting, the major air combat against ISIS was essentially coalition and largely US aircraft. You have to decide where you're going. You can be a partner, you can be independent, but if you want a meaningful US presence, you have to offer security at the minimum, and it has to be clear that Iraq at least emerges as a strong power independent of Iran. And with that, let me finish. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, and uh, you have uh, flagged out, I think, very important uh, issue and very important thing, which is we have, at, we as Iraqis have to decide where do we want to go uh, and why. And are we able to carry out, if we decide, for instance, to, to have certain kind of relation, whether partnership, whether independent, uh, whether any kind of, of relation. Are we able as Iraqis with our current resources, are we able to carry out such decision? This is, or these are questions that Iraqis should be prepared to answer it before uh, going to the dialogue with the United States. So, Right now, uh, I will open the stage for the Q&A. Uh, I think Rand has uh, collected all questions and uh, I will 
uh, give the stage to Rand to uh, ask the questions asked by uh, audience. Rand? Rand? Yes. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, Go hello. Ahead. So I will start with English so that the translator can um, translate everything. Um, and I would also like to ask the panelists to all change to English as their output language. Okay, great. So we have a lot of questions coming. We're not gonna be able to go through all of them. Uh, I will begin with the first one. It's from Ms. Rand Rahim. Just a second. Oh yeah. What does Iran want from the U.S.-Iraq dialogue? And this was addressed to everyone. I I will uh, I will make this. What? Please make sure you are on English if you are going to speak English, because I cannot hear you. You, you are on mute. Just please remove the mute. So, yeah. so this this question from uh, uh, ex ambassador ambassador Rand Rahim, uh, I think David can answer it. David, ha has you uh, have you uh, listened? Uh, yes, I have. Uh, yeah, thank okay. you, Munkid, and thank you, Ren. Um, as I heard it, the question is, what does Iran want from yeah. the U.S.-Iraq dialogue, right? The answer is very simple. Iran would like that dialogue to fail completely. And Iran would like the U.S. to just get out of Iraq so that it can take over the country even more than it already has with its militias, with its economic uh, subversion and exploitation of Iraq's resources. And, um, with, and that is despite, as Munkid's surveys demonstrate, despite the very sharp downturn in the Iraqi public's view of Iran and its aims in your country, including especially among the Shia majority of Iraq's population. So Iran would like to have a free hand in Iraq, and that means getting the U.S. out. Um, and I think that uh, there, unfortunately, there is a significant danger, in my view, partly because of the economic constraints that Tony Cordesman was talking about and the shift in American foreign policy priorities, uh, and partly because of the absence of a decisive Iraqi answer to that Iranian ambition, there is a, a significant danger that something like that could happen in the future. I personally am optimistic that we can working together with Iraqis, avoid that terrible outcome. But there's no guarantee. Okay, thank you, David. Yes, friend. And I have one from Mr. Loay saying, where do you see the, city, the position of policy of the USA towards Iraq in the next five to 10 years? Ma Michael, Michael, can you answer this question, please? Yeah, sure. So, across five to ten years you're talking about across uh, multiple u.s administrations um but let's just say for a second as a base case scenario you're dealing with a um, you know democrat uh in the white house from jan 2021 uh which is not a bad bet when you you know usually economics affect u.s elections quite a lot and we're going into a 1929 style depression so uh you know let's just say you get a change in national leadership in the us uh you're going back to a more obama type foreign policy very possibly very similar um you know including a lot of the same personnel involved 
uh, you know, Iraq's not going to be at the top of their agenda. Uh, pushing back very hard on Iran might not be on the top of their agenda either. Um, Iraq will have to pull its own weight. It will not be given special favors necessarily. It needs to justify U.S. involvement by seeming to be seeming to have some potential, seeming to be able to sort out its own problems with some help from the U.S. Iraq would not be able to rely on the U.S. to be the primary driver in its own recovery. Iraq would have to be the primary driver. And then the U.S. could be encouraged to assist with that from a security or economic perspective. Uh, you know, right now, this administration is finishing off the ISIS war, which it was involved with. It doesn't want to see that fail. It doesn't want to see the stability of Iraq fail. The next administration may not be very invested in that uh, because it wasn't there, you know, to go into, uh, I don't know, to fight Mosul, to, you know, defeat the Islamic State, etc. So, you know, Iraq has a small window of opportunity in the remaining months of this administration, might get another Trump administration, to, uh, to basically lock in mid-term U.S. support. If this opportunity window is lost, you know, it may be much harder to get U.S. attention in the future. And what if this administration win another uh, term? What do you think? Well, I think then the outlook is a bit better um, because you have a team inside the U.S. Uh, government and that team will change a bit in any transition. Uh, but nonetheless, the types of people who are rolled into Iraq policy in this administration, uh, you know, they still do have a significant level of commitment. I'm talking here about National Security Council level. Uh, that that would probably change, I think, under a Democrat administration, I think. Um, so, you know, I think if the Trump administration continues, you get more continuity in the current policy, which is to say, um, you know, quite keen interest in Iraq as a battlefront with Iran. But the positive side of that for Iraq is it does keep us interested and it keeps us very focused on, um, you know, we, we want to see prime ministers succeed because in our view, an independent Iraq first prime minister is a prime minister who's not being controlled by Iran. Uh, the next US administration, uh, if it's Democrat one, it, it may not care less who controls Iraq. Okay. Thank you, Mike. Rand? Yeah, I'm, I ju just a second, sorry. I'm just asking everyone to please write your question in the Q&A because in the chat it's very hard to hear. So, um, how would I be? Uh, okay, so I have uh, a question from Ms. Maison al Damluji. Uh, I understand that the PM is responsible for this. I do not expect the US to do. Uh, am I missing something? Okay, okay. I understand that the PM is responsible for this. I do not expect the US to do the job on it on his behalf. However, I also believe that with this, with the best uh, will be in the world, he alone would not be able to do it alone unless the international community puts it acts together, led by the okay. US and take positive so, measures. So this, I think, is a follow on from um, a written answer in the Q&A um, that I put out, where they were talking about uh, militia, right? Is it that one? I, I can't, I can't. Think yeah. Of so, so I think this is reference, um, you know, asking, you know, what can the US do to help Academy uh, to put arms under the control of the state? And what I said in the Q&A, written Q&A was that, you know, it's up to Iraq to do that. Um, when the US tries to get itself involved in stuff like that, it just makes it worse. Uh, you know, the US can't help an Iraqi prime minister to fight militias. It's not 2008 anymore. Uh, but so therefore, you know, ultimately Iraqi religious, political and military law enforcement uh, powers, they're the ones that can rein in a militia force. Now, you know, what can the international community do in the background? Well, a couple of things. Uh, first of all, they can strongly support an Iraqi prime minister and, uh, you know, ensure that uh, militias, criminal actors 
understand that Prime Minister has a lot of backing from the international community, and that can include, uh, you know, backing in terms of security cooperation. Uh, that can include provision of intelligence, uh, you know, and, and data on things like um, threat finance, on the way money flows uh, to militias. It can include sanctions. But, you know, the, primarily this is an Iraqi responsibility. When you look at, I'll give you an example, the most effective action against militias in Iraq over the last year plus is the Ataba Shrine militias associated with um, Grand Ayatollah Sistani saying, no, Abu Fadak cannot become the head of the Hashid al-Shabi. And maybe the Ataba will join the Ministry of Defense and leave the Hashid al-Shabi. Now that's an action that was taken by Iraqis 100% has nothing to do with Americans. And it's probably the most effective action uh, that, that has been taken to reform the Hashid al-Shabi. Okay, uh, Rand, I will uh, ask this question. Uh, it's from Dr. Karar Libderi. Uh, if I read it uh, correctly, Dr. Karar, he is asking, and this is for Anthony, uh, what, Washington would like to negotiate uh, in its strategic dialogue with Iraq. Uh, would it be uh, only about uh, the uh, security dialogue or there will be some economic, political or other things to be negotiated uh, and discussed with Iraqis? What do you think? I think this will be a fairly narrow strategy dialogue. Unless you have a clear plan as to what you want from the United States by way of security assistance, where you want to go in terms of building up the Iraqi forces, and this is approved by the Iraqi government, I think you have to focus on the relatively short-term security issues. I doubt by June you will know what your economic needs really are. There may be already the need to hold some kind of discussion about IMF loans or grants, because I do not believe there is going to be a major transfer of grant aid from anyone coming out of this environment of the scale that you need. But to ask for that loan, you need a realistic, agreed plan, something that not only addresses the budget, but where you're going in the future. And I don't see how a new prime minister could possibly do more than flag the need and say that you need to have a follow-on meeting because I have not seen any indication from your budget or from what I have seen about development so far that you have agreed on what you would ask for. And that would be a plan written before the oil crisis and the coronavirus. I think that's one of the key problems is how do we go from all the short-term issues to a lasting strategic relationship? And June at best can be just a beginning dealing with the most urgent issues. Okay. Uh, I have three questions here in Arabic, but we cannot take all questions. So yeah. this is for Bilal. Uh, Bilal, uh, ما الذي ستطرحه واشنطن على طاولة المفاوضات؟ What is Washington going to put on the table of negotiations؟ حتى تجعل المفاوض العراقي يتقبل so that it would make the Iraqi negotiator accepting the American one. If you can repeat it, please, Dr. Munkan. ما الذي ستطرحه واشنطن؟ أو what ما الذي يمكن تطرحه واشنطن على طاولة المفاوضات المقبلة؟ on the uh, table of negotiations 
كي تجعل المفاوض العراقي يتقبل الوجود It's an important thing by itself. It expresses a renewable existence of a USA in Iraq and uh, renewing uh, the Iraqi landscape. When we talk about uh, strategic dialogue, it is, uh, goes uh, against what we previously. فهذا يعني تغيير استراتيجي أمريكي واضح باتجاه علاقات إيجابية مع العراق. هذه نقطة أساسية برأيي. الحوار الاستراتيجي نقطة ثانية هي فرصة للجانب العراقي وللجانب الأمريكي صراحة للتفاهم الأعمق يعني مثل ما أنا ذكرت بكلمتي أن العراق تغير وواشنطن أيضا تغيرت ولكن الاثنين يتغيرون لكن الحوار بدأ يقل فقلة الحوار وقلة العلاقات وضعف الزيارات يعني مثلا السفير الامريكي زياره السفير الامريكي قليله قلت مقارنه بسابقاتها زياره المسؤولين العراقيين لواشنطن قلت مقارنه ب ب بالسوابق فالحوار صراحه ضروري حتى يكون في فرصه للجانبين انه الواحد يفهم الثاني وهمينا صراحه فرصه للجانب العراقي انه يعبر عن يعني المظالم والمشاكل يعني خلينا نقول يعتبون الامريكيين على ضرب مثلا قاسم سليماني بالاراضي العراقيه الى اخره وفرصه للجانب الامريكي انه هم أن يعبرون عن عتبهم ربما عن يعني مظالمهم انه احنا موجودين بالعراق على طلبكم وانتم ما تحمونا والى اخره فيكون في فرصه انه أنا احكي اللي بقلبي وانت تحكي اللي بقلبك وبعدين نجي نناقش على انه شنو هي الاولويات اللي تساعد هاي العلاقه انه تبقى علاقه استراتيجيه وليس علاقه عابره برأيي النقطة الثالثة إنه كيف نوسع العلاقة؟ إنه ما تكون علاقة فقط عن العلاقات العسكرية واللي هي طبعاً مهمة كلش لأنه بدون الأمن وبدون الاستقرار ما في حكي على الاقتصاد وعلى الاستثمار وعلى الزراعة وعلى العلاقات الثقافية أو الأكاديمية فالاستقرار الأمني مهم كلش ودحر داعش وهم يرجعون مرة ثانية بمناوشات يستغلون مثلا المناطق بين بين الاقليم وبين المركز يستغلون الحدود العراقيه السوريه الى اخره فالضغط على داعش مهم ولكن بنفس الوقت الضغط على الميليشيات مهم لعدم تقويض هيبه الدوله وهي من من اولويات يعني اي حكومه قادمه عراقيه يعني مثلا من واشنطن الواحد يشوف العراق يعني معقول رئيس وزراء يقبل انه ايران تجيب صواريخ وتخليها بالعراق تحميها يعني يعطوها للميليشيات والحكومه الامريكيه تروح للدوله العراقيه وتشوفهم صور وتشوفهم تقارير استخباراتيه ومعلومات انه هاي الصواريخ اجت من هذا الموقع وهي موجوده بهذا الموقع والحكومه العراقيه يعني ما ما تتحرك فيعني هذه امور مهمه انه لازم الجانبين يتعاملون وياها والنقطه الاخيره مثل ما آه ذكر الاستاذ آه آه استاذ كوردزمان انه هاي العلاقه لازم تكون علاقات غير عسكريه فقط يعني تكون علاقه مو علاقه عسكريه فقط ولكن علاقات آه شامله وهذه محتاجه انه يعني اوكي انا انا يعني لمت الشركات الامريكيه لعدم وجودهم في العراق آه ولهذا السبب نرى يعني ان ان العلاقه غير متينه ولكن يعني ثوره تشرين هي ثورة عراقية للشاب العراقي من المناطق التي هي كانت بصورة عامة بعيدة عن المشاكل الطائفية وبعيدة عن مش عن داعش صراحة يعني ذي قار لا صار عندها حرب طائفية ولا صارت فيها مشكلة مع داعش ولكن نسبة الفقر في ذي قار 45% يعني هذا صوت منو؟ اوكي صوت ايران صحيح بس صوش امريكا يلا ما يخالف قبلناها بس في النهايه هناك ضعف للدوله العراقيه هناك فساد يعني الفساد في العراق ليس مشكله اقتصاد فقط وانما مشكله امن قومي مشكله امن دوله ويعني الجانب العراقي يجب ان يعلم وليس فقط يعني من ضغط امريكي دبلوماسي خارجي ولكن هناك ضغط شعبي 
يتماشى مع هذا الطلب الأمريكي أن على العراق أن تكون الدولة تأخذ من الإصلاحات الاقتصادية على رأس الأولويات من الإصلاحات الحكم الرشيد على أصل على يعني سقف الأولويات على مدى العراق يكون دولة تقبل أن الشركات الأجنبية ليس الأمريكية فقط الشركات الأجنبية التي لديها رأس مال أن تأتي للعراق وتستثمر في العراق وليس الشركات النفطية فقط وإنما شركات السياحة، الزراعة، الصناعة آه إلى آخره فأنا أرى أن الملف الاقتصادي يجب أن يكون على الطاولة وعلى واشنطن أن تضغط من أجل الشعب العراقي على الحكومة العراقية بأن تأخذ الإصلاحات الاقتصادية بجدية منها الإصلاح البنكي قضية المكاتب الاقتصادية للأحزاب وللميليشيات يعني هذه أمور لا تسمح بها أي دولة طبيعية ولهذا إن كان العراق يريد أن يكون الدولة طبيعية لديها علاقة طبيعية مع الغير هذا مهم النقطة الأخيرة هي العلاقة العراقية مع إيران أمريكا لا تريد من العراق أن تكون ندا لإيران ولا تكون عدوا لإيران ولكن الطلب أن لا تكون بغداد تابعة لإيران علاقات جيرة مع إيران كما هناك علاقات جيرة مع الأردن مثلا وليس تباعية كما يريد بعض الأطراف العراقية مع الأسف Okay, um, I will ask the last couple of questions for, for the English um, because I have so many coming, so I'm sorry if I can't. Okay. Okay, so I have Ms. Amira, a journalist, says, uh, I think the main problem lies in the United States of America not defining the features of the relationship with Iraq now and in the future. And this confusion reinforces the relationship with Iran. So I ask, when can we see clear features of the United States relationship, relationship yes, with Iraq, especially if the Republicans and Democrats have unified visions about Iraq, if it's America's crisis or an opportunity to restore its international prestige? David? Thank you. That, that's, a, that's a very good and very hard question. Uh, the, the, in the last few years, and this is true, I think, both of the Obama and of the Trump administrations, uh, there have been a lot of what we call flip-flops going back and forth in American policy inside the U.S. government, divisions inside the U.S. government, changes of mine by the US president and it, it and a lack overall of a clear policy or a statement or definition even to ourselves of what exactly it is that the United States today wants in Iraq and how we want to work with Iraq in order to accomplish that it's 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 a really very serious problem that we have at the same time, as, um, as seen from Washington, as I see it personally, and I think my colleagues would probably agree, we are also not seeing a clear policy from Iraq about how they want to control their own affairs and what they want exactly from the United States. We see divisions, of course, everybody knows this, among Iraqis at the political level especially about that. And we see uh, very serious structural problems in just getting a government together and maintaining a competent security uh, posture and an effective uh, development of Iraq's tremendous economic potential, um, all of those things are lacking or at least deficient on the Iraqi side. So both sides are, in my view, uh, share the responsibility for this um, state of affairs and this confusion, uh, this, uh, I would say, neglect and 
really very mediocre outcome. And Iran, unfortunately, takes advantage of that, um, as do as as ISIS did, and that is uh, very much to the detriment, I think, both of the United States, but especially of the Iraqi people. Now, if the the follow up question, therefore, is is there can we expect at least on the American side, since that's what you're asking about, a clearer definition and implementation of an American policy toward Iraq in the future. Uh, I wish I could say yes, <laughs> but um, I think we um, are going to have to deal with a lot of uncertainty in the, in the foreseeable future. Besides the economic and health crisis that we're in right now, obviously we have an election coming up in November. Nobody knows what the outcome of that will be. And nobody knows what might happen in the region or somewhere else in the world that will uh, take priority over anything that has to do with Iraq in the next year or two or three. As I said, right at the very beginning, when we started this very interesting discussion, Iraq is not a top priority for the United States. It's important for the United States, but certainly not anything like what it was 10 years ago or 15 years ago or even five years ago for many reasons. And I think that if Iraq demonstrates an interest and a willingness to engage very seriously in a partnership with the United States, the United States will respond in a very positive way. But we're never going to see the kind of, at least as far as I can imagine, the kind of massive American involvement in Iraq in economic, military and diplomatic terms that we did when I was still in the US government. Um, and actually, I think that's a good thing for Iraqis. I think that the United States and someone else, I'll end with this uh, right now, someone else asked about why, why or an early question that I saw on the screen, why did the United States not have better tools for exercising its influence in Iraq. And I think actually the United States had too many tools <laughs> for a long time, um, put too much into Iraq. And the result was that too much interference created dependence and created uh, um, internal conflicts in Iraq and created uh, a feeling in the United States ultimately that we were spending too much money and too much time and too many lives in Iraq for our own good. And I think that was not a good long-term strategy for the United States. And I was, I tried personally to convince the US government a long, long time ago that we needed to reduce the expectations of Iraqis and of Americans about how much the United States could change Iraq or control Iraq and let Iraqis take the primary responsibility for that. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, David. I would be fully agree with you that neither Iraq nor United States uh, have uh, a clear vision about what do they need from each other. And this maybe make the next dialogue more important than, uh, uh, and it might be an opportunity because from my point of view, I can see that Iran is the only one which has 
a clear vision about what it needs from Iraq. So this is a strategic advantage of, uh, for Iran over Iraq and uh, United States. And I can see Mike uh, have some, uh, he wants to, to comment on that. Mike? Yeah, just very quickly, um, the newest piece that we published um, about, uh, you know, the move from Zerfit Academy, I'll put the URL onto the chat. I focused on some very, very simple topics that the US should bring up at the next strategic dialogue. It's like going back to basics because the US-Iraq relationship has got very hot, you know, with Iraqi Prime Minister and US Secretary of State shouting at each other on the phone. This, this doesn't happen usually. The way to go back to basics is very simple. Um, first, we have to restore the, the rules. And the rules are this. Iraq protects our people inside the country. So stop killing our people. And Iraq looks at thinking about how to stop money getting to the kind of people that we think are terrorists. Whether it's Hezbollah, Qatar Hezbollah, Lebanese Hezbollah, Qatar Hezbollah, uh, you know, uh, um, you know, Mohammed uh, Kathrani, whoever. Uh, on the other side, you know, we will stop dropping bombs in Iraq and we will stop sanctioning Iraqi leaders. So I think the first step is to just make things normal again and go back to basics. Okay. Uh, it seems that Amira question uh, dropped uh, a lot of uh, interest. So uh, I think Anthony has also a comment on that. Come on, Anthony, please. I cannot hear. No. You are muted. Yes. Okay. Yes. I think you had a very good summary from Michael of what you can do in June. I don't think there is a single Iraqi in this audience that's been listening to us who has any idea where Iraq will be economically and as a government by September. I think that one of the critical issues that you really have here, though, is given the economic and political pressures, as David pointed out, you are going to have to make and show the people that the government is making progress by then. It may simply be that you have started a reform and a plan. So you might really have to ask yourself as a nation and as a political structure, how are you going to move forward? I think we in the United States could still respond if we have either a strategic partner that defines what it means to be a partner or in Iraq that has a plan to be a stronger, more independent state. But to go back to points David raised, all my experience has taught me that you can only help a country that can help itself. If it does not have a government, if it does not have an economic reform plan, if it does not have a cohesive military, you can fix little pieces of the problem for a while. But ultimately, unless you meet that responsibility, we will not be able to help. We can only go on putting band-aids, tiny little bandages on the Iraqi problem. Well, this looks very strange for me, not as Munkid, but as Iraqi, because as Munkid, I know what, what you are. Um, but for the majority of Iraqis, they think that United States, on the contrary, it needs a weak Iraq, dependent Iraq, uh, divided Iraq, uh, and uh, not a reliable 
independent, strong partner. How do you rec uh, comment on that, uh, Anthony? From our viewpoint, if you were a strong, independent state that simply contained and deterred Iran and operated as a normal economy, we would be delighted because it would cost us absolutely nothing and it would strengthen our security position far beyond anything else that you could do. We do not need a dependent or divided Iraq. But here I will disagree with my colleagues on one other point. Iran doesn't need a united or strong Iraq. All it needs is a divided and weak Iraq, a country it can occasionally exploit, but which cannot be a counterweight or a force that limits Iran. And this spoiler function is much easier than fixing something. Okay, thank you, Anthony. Uh, Rand? Here you go. Uh, just please, I'm sorry, just please start to minimize your answers because we have so many questions that we will not be able to answer. For sure, we, for sure we won't be able to. Uh, uh, all, okay. those, all those audience uh, uh, should excuse us if we yeah. were not able to, to uh, ask their questions. Yeah. So before switching to Arabic questions, uh, last English question from Dr. Saifuddin al-Darraji. Uh, what should be done by the Iraqi government, i.e. next government, to avoid the unwanted ramifications of the conflict between the U.S. and Iran or to de-escalate the tension between them? And having said that, do, do you think that there is any possibility to convince and encourage all the key players to sit at the table? Thank you. Bilal, have you heard that? On the chat as well, if you... Uh, is it the uh, Mustafa Salim question? No, it's no, Dr. Saifuddin Darraji. This is Saifuddin Darraji, my friend, Saifuddin Darraji. So you, you have to answer that in a good manner. Could you, could you, I'm, I'm trying to find the, the question. I wasn't... Done? I was answering another question that someone asked. Uh, right again? Answer. Just a second. I'm I'm po I posted it again. What should be done by the Iraqi government, next government, to avoid the unwanted? Yeah. I see it. I see it. Okay, sure. Um, I mean, this is also related to a question that was uh, that was asked, and I was. Uh, I mean, the reason I wasn't paying attention to to your question, I'm sorry. I was apologizing because I was responding responding to some of to some of. في النهاية مثل ما مثل ما ذكرت سابقا يعني أمريكا أو واشنطن ما تريد إنه العراق يكون يعني عراق زمن صدام وتكون وتحارب إيران وتكون عدو لإيران وإلى آخره وما أدري إيش البوابة الحالية الشرقية للوطن العربي يعني هاي الأمور مضت عليها كل عليه الدهر وشرب هاي مو طبيعة العلاقة طبيعة العلاقة إنه العراق يكون دولة uh, على قولة uh, uh, السفير السابق الأمريكي في في بغداد أو القائم بالأعمال uh, جوي هود اللي قال إنه العراق يكون عندها دولة يكون عندها ترافيك لايت أنت تعال يعني شرط المرور أنت تعال أنت روح أنت أوقف الدور عليك يعني يكون عندها فرصة إنه ما تكون دولة علاقتها مع إيران وبس وتتبع أوامر إيران وبس بل يكون لها علاقات طبيعية مع uh, غير الدول من الأمور اللي اللي صراحة أصبح يعني أعطت فرصة لإيران إنه يكون عندها دور أكبر من غيرها هي أيضا الغياب الإقليمي الدول الخليجية بأمورها الداخلية يعني نظرتها ربما السلبية تاريخيا للعراق بعد سقوط بعد احتلال العراق مثلا من في 2003 رؤيتهم للعراق رؤية طائفية وليس رؤية مثلا استراتيجية ولو هناك يعني إصلاحات وتعديلات في هذه النظرة من جانب تركيا كانت لها دور ربما مهم أساسي خصوصا في في علاقتها مع الإقليم وبالجانب الاقتصادي الآن هي منشغلة بأمور ربما يعني تشغلها عن الشأن العراقي الوضع الداخلي الأمن الداخلي في تركيا وضع الحزب العدالة والتنمية انشغالها في سوريا انشغالها في في ليبيا 
اذا هناك فراغ في العراق انه الايران تستغلها يعني القضيه مو فقط يعني ربما ضعف الدوله العراقيه والذي هو السبب الاساسي ولكن ايضا غياب الغير غياب الغير هو نقطه اساسيه على الحكومه العراقيه هناك ايضا يعني سؤال ربما مرتبط بهذا الامر وهو الجانب الاقتصادي وكما ذكرت ذكرهم زملائي ايضا يعني ليش الصين تلعب دور اساسي في الاقتصاد العراقي ربما اكثر من من الاقتصادات او الدول الثانيه يعني النقطه الاساسيه هي وهذا انا ارجو ان يعني يتفهمه الجمهور العراقي الحكومات الصينيه تاخذ اوامر من الحكومه الصينيه لكن الشركات الامريكيه لا تاخذ اوامر من الحكومه الامريكيه يعني هذا قانونيا الحكومه الامريكيه ليس لها الحق ان تطلب من شركه امريكيه ان تذهب للعراق الشركات الامريكيه تاخذ الاوامر من يعني من 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 مصالحها ومن يعني هم البورد اللي يتحكمون بالشركه فاذا اذا العراق ارادت ان تكون الشركات المستثمره في العراق شركات اوروبيه وشركات عالميه وشركات امريكيه وليس شركات ايرانيه وصينيه فقط اذا يجب هناك يعني ان ان يعالج الاصلاح ان 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 يتم الاصلاح في الحكومه العراقيه قضيه القوانين قضية حفظ الممتلكات الأجنبية هناك خوف مثلا من الحكومة العراقية سوف تقوم بتأميم شركة أجنبية وقضية محاربة الفساد يعني الفساد أصبحت كما ذكرت أصبحت مسألة أمن وطني بالنسبة للعراق الفساد في الجيش يخسرك ثلث البرد لداعش الفساد في الاقتصاد يمنع التجارة العالمية والاستثمار العالمي من الوجود في العراق الفساد يغضب الشارع العراقي يعني انا اعطيك مثال ذاك اليوم سمعت ان وزاره الثقافه العراق لا عدد السواق عدد السواق في وزاره الثقافه العراقيه اكبر من موظفي وزاره الثقافه الصينيه بالكامل يعني هذه لا هي صوت الاحتلال ولا هي صوت ايران ولا يعني هذه مشاكل عراقيه بامتياز يجب على العراق ان يحلوها على مود الدول الثانيه تاخذ العراق بجديه وتحترمها كدوله وايضا يروا ان الفرص الموجوده هي متاحه والدوله العراقيه تعمل للاقتصاد العام وليس لاقتصاد الاحزاب وجماعات صغيره. بس حبيت انوه عن شغله ثانك يو بلال وي هاف 10 مينتس يو شود انسر فور كويستشن سو تو تو مينتس لدينا 10 دقائق هذا يعني انه لدينا اربع اوكي yeah. okay. بس حابه اقول شغله ال... الاسئله ما قاعده تنسال باي شكل ما دام انحاز لاي شخص هو بس هذا يداء الحق اقراه فما دام يكون بتحيز لاي دوله او اي شيء تجي هيج كومنتات ارجع على الاسئله بس ثواني يعني اسفه هل امريكا تتقبل الحوار مع اذرع ايران ممن من من يعلن ولاء اهل العراق ويعلن بعده عن مصالح ايران وهل ممكن رفع العقوبات عنهم ان ابدوا حقيقه ولائهم للعراق هاي من استاذ بسام القزويني اسفه اذا دا اقول اسم غلط تو ديفيد ما 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 محدد يس تو ديفيد Yeah. Thank you. I, I didn't hear the question clearly. Can you repeat it? اوكي كان اسيدي بالعربي بالعربي ديفيد ماشي اوكي رفع العقوبات الامريكيه على طهران people who are loyal to iran people who are loyal to iran to iran can they remove the sanctions on them على الميليشيات على الميليشيات اه اوكي all right look i i i have to say that this is maybe the hardest problem in this relation i think that the united states as a government is willing to distinguish among different units of the hashtag so that it's only the ones 
that we think are attacking Americans and that are completely loyal to Iran rather than to the Iraqi government that we impose sanctions against. I think the US government understands that the Iraqi government has decided to integrate the militias into Iraq's own armed forces and put them under government control. And that is something that the US government in principle accepts. But if there are militias inside Iraq that continue to shoot rockets at American soldiers and civilians and oil companies, injuring and killing Americans and Iraqis on their own territory, then the US government is not going to accept that and is not only going to impose sanctions against those people, but probably will لكن react militarily. ربما, uh, ربما striking against those militias and their leaders. And this is a very tough problem, but in my opinion, it is the responsibility of the Iraqi government to control those militias. That is not something that the United States should have to do for Iraq. It's in Iraq's own interest to keep those militias quiet. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. السؤال الثاني الولايات المتحدة ضخت 2.2 مليار من أين جاءت؟ Where where it pumped? Hello. رند عيد السؤال رند عيد السؤال. الولايات المتحدة ضخت 2.2 مليار دولار من أين جاءت بها؟ هذا السؤال هي تشان سؤال سؤال ما بس لو كتبوا مره ثانيه شوفي غير سؤال سؤال مو واضح كيف ترون مستقبل التظاهرات في العراق والتحديات التي تواجهها؟ ربما انا اعقب على هذا السؤال اذا اذا ممكن استاذ منقذ ورن yeah. okay. يعني قضيه المظاهرات صراحه هي ربما العامل الاساسي والضغط الأساسي على الحكومة العراقية الشؤون الخارجية والعلاقات الخارجية هي مهمة لكن تهم الدولة ولكن المظاهرات أظهرت ضعف الإدارة وضعف الدولة العراقية وصراحة فشل الدولة العراقية في حماية المصالح المصالح العراقيين وأظهرت أن يعني ربما هناك التقاء بين ما تطلبه أمريكا من الحكومة العراقية وما يطلبه الشارع الاثنين يطلبون من حكومة عراقية تحمي المصالح العراقية أكبر وأهم من المصالح ربما الإيرانية يعني هناك ربما رسالة واضحة في حرق المقرات الإيرانية من جانب وهناك أيضا رسالة واضحة أن الحكومة العراقية سمحت بالهجوم على السفارة الأمريكية ولكن قتلت عشرات العراقيين لما رادوا أن يهجموا على السفارة الإيرانية في بغداد هذا من جانب العلاقات الدولية من الجانب الوضع الداخلي النظام العراقي السياسي من النوع انه يعني يعطيك يعني هناك عشرات الايادي للتقبيل والشكر ولكن ليس هناك يعني وجه الواحد يعني يضربه مثلا على لما لما يغضب لانه الكل مشارك بالفساد ولكن لا احد مسؤول عن الفساد مثلا في دوله مثل مثل مصر يكون فيها فساد يقول لك الشعب يريد اسقاط النظام لانه النظام هو حسني مبارك بس بالعراق النظام انت منو تسقط؟ ما موجود شخص محدد او نظام واحد لذلك هذا يعني الثورة تشرين أظهرت الخلل في السياسة العراقية في الحكم العراقي في النظام العراقي في الفساد العراقي وعدم استطاعة البلد أن يخدم المصالح العراقية وإعطاء الفرصة لإيران بالتغلغل وسوء استفادة من هذه الفوضى العراقية يعني ربما هناك فرصة مرا... يعني ضغط على السياسيين العراقيين على المجتمع السياسي القيادة السياسية العراقية ضغط داخلي مجتمعي عراقي رغم كل الاتهامات بأنها 
مظاهرات أجنبية ممولة من السي آي اي وكل هاي الخزعبلات وكأن الشعب العراقي لا يعني لا يملك من الوعي أن يعرف أن نسبة الفقر في محافظة المثنى مثلا هي 55% من جانب فإذا هناك ضغط جماهيري والآن هناك فرصة وضغط خارجي على الدولة العراقية أن تكون دولة تقف على أرجلها وتحمي المصالح العراقية قبل مصالح الغير أنا أرى أن أن الضغوط الدولية والمطالب المجتمعية العراقية ملتقية بهذا الأمر بالضغط على الإصلاحات الجذرية في الحكومة العراقية آسفة المقاطعة آخر سؤال إذا استمر التفوق الإيراني في العراق والذي يؤدي إلى انهيار العراق كدولة كليا ألا تتحمل أمريكا جزء من هذه المسؤولية مستقبلا تبعا لأحداث تبعا لأحداث 2003 السؤال من أوس الدين أنا آسفة لكل الباقين ما قدرت أسأل أسأل أسئلتهم بس هواية أكو أسئلة وما ما لحقنا نقرأ كل شيء السؤال السؤال المن سؤال رانت شنو هو؟ ما كان موجه لأحد معين بس شنو هو السؤال؟ أنا ما سمعت لأنه جاي رقم يعني صوت المترجم إذا استمر التفوق الإيراني في العراق والذي يؤدي إلى انهيار العراق كدولة كليا ألا تتحمل أمريكا جزء من هذه المسؤولية مستقبلا تبعا لأحداث 2003 واضح؟ يا yeah. أنتوني I think that the practical realities of this. 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 I think أن يحدث من تغييرات سياسية في داخل إيران من أجل أن يكون هناك تسوية أعتقد أن المشكلة التي كانت موجودة مع ذلك كان يمكن أن يحل لم يكن ممكن أن يحل المشكلة ولكن على الأقل أن يخففها ولذلك في المشكلة قادمة من إيران يمكن أن تحل بأن تتعامل بشكل جيد مع مع جيرانها سواء مع العراق أو مع دول الخليج أو مع سوريا ومع أي دولة أخرى تقوم بالتدخل فيها حاليا فالمسألة هو أنها يمكن أن يكون هناك رد عن لها أو احتواء